I have spent hours running through Hyrule, and I gotta say, this sequel is worth every penny. Breath of the Wild came out five years ago, and now we finally have a way to continue playing. While I'm going to try my best not to spoil anything story-wise, some parts of the video may show some parts of the game that you might be surprised by. If you want to learn about everything on your own, play the game for a couple hours, and then come back to this video. But this isn't going to be a full review. After all, I haven't even finished the game for many obvious reasons, but I have played enough to understand how I feel about this game and what I want to tell you. My name is Matt from Real World Review, and today I'm going to review something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. Not only reviewing a video game, but also one of the most hyped games that I've seen in a very long time, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. For starters, this feels different from Breath of the Wild. It's been a while since I've played that game, on purpose, but the way that you play just feels so weird to me. For one, Sheikah stuff is gone, kind of. The Sheikah slate is pure as pad, and ruins are just gone, I guess. As you play the game, there is dialogue talking about past events, which makes it even weirder that you don't actually see those objects, even in the very beginning. Like, literally the beginning. Zelda initially has a pad, not Link. Also, it's called the Pure Pad, not the Sheikah Slate. For those not playing the game, this may not mean anything to you. But for those returning, it feels jarring. Instead of ruins, you get these new abilities. However, the way to activate them is a little strange. To activate the new abilities, you just press L, which you'll get most of them before you leave the main island, just like Breath of the Wild. But there's two missing. One I barely found last minute, which helps with the Ultra Hand, but the last one, I'm not really sure what that is, and obviously it's put there for a reason. The strange thing is that on Breath of the Wild, all you would have to do is push up if you want to switch runes, while on this game, holding the L does the same thing for the new abilities. That's fine, but just like if you have Apple Pay on your iPhone, this actually slows down that button. Sometimes. So it might delay or trigger the switching menu, even if you don't want to. And trust me, I've tried this multiple times, it's not that I'm holding it too long, I'll literally just tap the button and sometimes it'll show the menu. Also, this arrow that kind of follows where you move the stick does not look that good. I think they should have just went with the design that highlights whatever you're pointing to. And then, everything else is similar, but upgraded. You can attach items to arrows now, but also throw items separately, which is something that I forget. Yeah, I've wasted so many arrows this way. But using left, right, and up will toggle things like items, shields, and weapons, but not arrows. That's because, again, you just get normal arrows with the option to attach pretty much anything, whether it's beneficial or not. One thing that I hate is that when you're in combat, or if you don't go into the menu, there's no option to actually toggle a description or fuse strength. Meaning that you can attach something thinking that it does one thing, and then it ends up doing nothing, or not being as strong as you thought. Obviously, all you gotta do is just go into the menu, but it's one extra step that is a little weird. And when shooting from an arrow, it is weird to go into the menu, see what the item is, go back, pull the bow, and then add whatever attachment you want on there. For example, there's an item that you can use to light up things, and then another that can be used as like a flashbang. They both somewhat seem interchangeable, but definitely are not. So a literal description for what it's gonna do, or at least a toggle to give us that option, would be nice. It is kind of similar to using the fuse ability, which will allow you to fuse, cool, but it doesn't tell you the benefits. With that said, you can destroy the fused item without destroying your weapon or shield, so it's not really the end of the world if you do the wrong thing. And yeah, you can pretty much attach anything, and it does what you think. Like attaching a wing to a weapon and throwing it causes it to fly straight super far. Similar to how Ultra Hand is essentially Magnesis, but way better, Fuse takes the weapon system and just makes it so much better. Then we have Recall and Ascend. The latter I forget about constantly, while the former is almost overpowered, but also forgotten. What Recall does is reverses most moving things. So the common thing is when rocks fall out of the sky, you can take them up, or you can solve shrines in the wrong ways. There are, however, some shrines that it doesn't work for, so this doesn't become a bad thing or make the game easier. Ascend honestly feels like Cryonis. Both aren't actually needed, but I can see how this helps for some situations, but also doesn't even work in the areas that I want it to. I honestly forget about this ability all the time. As for combat, I like it, but it does become a little bit difficult. There's no difficulty setting, more of just making sure that you get armor and weapons that make yourself better. And if you think the game is pretty easy, just jump off the Sky Island directly into the Great Plateau. I dare you. When fighting, you need to jump around, counter, and fury rush, but in the times that you fail to do this, this game punishes you. 
even if you land a move. In real life, have you ever hit someone with a weapon and they just immediately hit you as if nothing happened? Yeah, that's this game. Now this isn't really new, but it just gets insane when you jump down and there's four plus enemies and literally a boss trying to attack you. I barely got clothes on, man. Give me a decent weapon. And I can only imagine what the Lionels are like in this game, if there are any. However, the combat is where you start to remember that this game is infinite. There are endless, well technically not, amounts of combinations in weapons, shields, and arrows that allow you to battle everyone differently every time. I mean, realistically, there are too many things to do, but it doesn't get overwhelming. But just like Breath of the Wild, it's easy to get sidetracked. You can be completing the main quest, but also trigger a side quest, and then see a shrine, and then a shooting star. It feels overwhelming, but the way that the game handles it is pretty simple. Pick one quest, complete the others later. Easy. This at least tries to keep you on your path. Either I'm dumb, or there's no simple end to this game. After the tutorial for Breath of the Wild, you can go directly to the boss, literally ending the game in less than an hour if done properly. In Tears of the Kingdom, I've been completing quests, and it doesn't feel like I'm anywhere near the end. I don't even know if there are runes in this game, or what other missing features there are. Like I said, I haven't had enough time to even come close to finishing this game, but I've already spent so much time on it. The ability to complete this game how you'd like makes us really feel like you're playing rather than controlling Link. Honestly, once I left the Sky Islands into Hyrule, I looked up and I realized that there is no way that I can experience this game's offering in such a short time. And there's actually even more to explore, which I'll let you find out once you play the game. Trust me, it's wild. Fast travel is still here, so no worries about that. Getting used to having different options can be strange, but you need to get out of the habit really thinking out of the box. The shrines in Breath of the Wild would constantly get you out of your element, but in Tears of the Kingdom, everything will constantly have you thinking how to complete a task, because realistically, there's no right way, just a bunch of different ways. This game is absolutely worth it. If it's anything like Breath of the Wild, which it already seems like it overdoes, the game will be endlessly replayable. There are so many things to see, but also revisit. The feel of the game is nostalgic, starting with the fact that the game map runs off a more modern version of Breath of the Wild's Hyrule, but it also has changed to the point where it feels like you've been somewhere that you haven't. Now the story can be debatable for the player, as after all, this game is rated E10+, or a Switch game with kids in mind. That being said, this feels like a game made for the Nintendo Switch dock, a game made for the original Zelda fans that want a 3D game. A game that is open world with controls that actually make sense. And just like Breath of the Wild, an actual jump button. But this game does not come without its faults. For one, fast travel can take some time if you're leaving the sky or ground. And frame rate drops will happen. Generally on Breath of the Wild, there would be some frame drops that I would see with different ruins being activated. But in Tears of the Kingdom, not only is it more frequent when triggering abilities, but even more when running around. It isn't to the point where it affects the gameplay, but if someone says that they never experience frame drops, they're definitely lying or not paying attention. Also, for some reason when I'm recording this, I get 1080p at 60 frames per second, but when I play it without recording, I get 1080p at 30 frames per second when docked. Not sure why. There are way worse performing games out there, even being released now, and like I said, Breath of the Wild wasn't perfect either. If that game ran at about 90%, I would say Tears of the Kingdom is about 75%. Having it docked does help a little bit, but not to the point where you should keep it docked all the time. No, it's the fact that the game runs off SD card speeds and has a CPU and GPU that's over 5 years old and of course made with handheld use in mind. I mean think about it, this runs an eMMC chip, while the Samsung Galaxy S6 had UFS which is faster than eMMC. If you're a fan of Zelda and 3D titles, I would say this is absolutely worth considering. If you've played or wanted to play Breath of the Wild, I would say absolutely this game is worth it. Even having both games, I see that this is not just a DLC, but something way more. This video barely scratches the surface, and I can't wait to see what we all discover as this game gets to the same age as Breath of the Wild. This game is timeless and filled with an outrageous amount of content, and even now, I have so many questions. Like I said, are the runes gone? What about ancient arrows? Are all the guardians actually gone? What about the Divine Beast and the abilities that come with them? I mean, I just miss flying up with Rivali's Gale, but I guess recalling a falling rock kind of helps with that. Also, is the Master Cycle in here? I know it's kind of redundant now, but maybe that's the last rune? I don't know. There's so much to learn, more than I could talk about in one video. 
and that's what helped Breath of the Wild become such an iconic game, and I'm glad we finally have another installment to expand on the original with Tears of the Kingdom. And who knows, maybe they're part of a trilogy? Maybe the next one is waiting for a more powerful Switch. I hope you all enjoyed this video. This is my first time reviewing something other than like a device, and even then, this is more of a partial review of the game. I would love to do a full review when the time comes, so let me know what you think. Of course, go ahead and pick up the game, and link in the description, no pun intended, will help the channel and show you where to buy the game. I've waited almost four years to play this game, and I'm happy to see that this game is just as good as I hoped it would be. And now that I'm done with this video, I'm gonna get some sleep and explore Hyrule another day. As always, thanks for watching.